Can I see worshipers in their house? If you're a worshiper in this place, let me see you wave your hands to heaven. Heaven looks for one your place. Wave your hands to him. And it is a rare privilege and honor for me to be able to stand here today and encourage you and tell you how great our God is as an evangelist of my father in the Lord, Prophet T.B. Joshua. You may have your seat. Yes, I pray that this message will inspire you not to give up but to endure because victory is for those who endure amen yes god's promises demand for patience and endurance many of us here today many of us viewers around the world are promise carriers 
we have the promise of God, but we lack the patience, perseverance, and endurance to see those promises fulfilled in our lives. The greatest mistakes are made because of impatience and the failure to wait for God's time, especially in the face of life's storms. Don't give up. Endure. It is possible is a statement of valuable advice, oftentimes given by men and women who have become the center of their worlds. A statement of advice oftentimes given by men and women who have achieved the extraordinary in their lives and in their careers because they were persistent and did not allow their weaknesses, did not allow their failures or their shortcomings to get the best of them, discourage their efforts and wipe them out. That is why they can give us that advice today. And that will bring us to the title of our message, Endure, It Is Possible. Tell your neighbor, Endure, Endure, It Is Possible. Throughout history, we remember those who never gave up. Those who stood the test of time, who were willing to go the extra mile, are the ones we remember. And the ones who chose to call it quits are the ones we never remember. Those who chose to give up are the ones we don't remember. Let's reflect back for a moment on the achievements in history. Do you know that you and I would not enjoy the light bulb today? I mean electric lights if the inventor Thomas Edison had given up after his numerous failed attempts. Tell your neighbor, endure. It is possible. You and I would not enjoy aviation today if the inventors of the world's first aeroplane, the Wright brothers, had given up when their multiple attempts to fly literally kept crashing. They became the laughing stock of jeering onlookers, mocking their vision that men would one day fly. But here we are today. We can hop onto an aeroplane at any time to any destination in the world without thinking twice because the Wright brothers never gave up on their vision. They were persistent. Tell your neighbor, endure, endure. It is possible. Yes, when God gives you a vision and it is opposed by men, don't reduce your vision. Endure. Don't give up. It is achievable. Amen. Do you know that you and I will still believe that the world is flat? We will still believe that the earth is flat if not for the ancient Greek scientist who had an independent mind stood against the wrong perception of the majority to prove that the world is actually what? Round. Tell your neighbor, endure. It is possible. Yes, in the book of Genesis, we read about how Noah became the laughing stock of his generation when he was building the ark. Can you just imagine someone building a massive ship in the middle of nowhere with no water in sight? He became the laughing stock of his generation. But my brothers and sisters, as the heavens opened and the rain continued to fall, laughter soon turned to wailing. And mass hysteria was soon drowned into silence as the waters covered the earth, a generation was wiped out and prophecy was fulfilled. I think that Noah must have thanked God 
at that point in time. That he did not listen to the majority to give up and allow his focus to be broken. Think about it. If Noah had quit, what would have become of mankind today? How does that strike you? Tell your neighbor, endure. Endure. It is possible. Yes. What about Peter, who walked on water? Do you remember Peter? Well, most of us actually remember Peter for losing focus and sinking into the sea. But the fact of the matter is that Peter walked on water. As long as Peter remained focused on our Lord Jesus Christ, and he did not look at the negative sense evidence around him, the storm surrounding him, if he remained focused, as long as he kept that focus, Peter achieved the impossible. Tell your neighbor, endure. It is achievable. It is possible. You and I, my brothers and sisters, would not enjoy salvation today. We would not enjoy God's mercy and favor today. We would not be able to approach the Father of light who rules from the throne of grace if our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ had given up in the Garden of Gethsemane that day. God is not a God for those who quit, but for those who endure. Tell your neighbor, endure. Endure. It is possible. The book of Hebrews 11, from verse 1 to 2, tells us that faith is the confidence of what we hope for and the assurance of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. Hebrews 11, the faith chapter, is really all about men and women who never gave up. What did they have that God would honor them and remember them by recording them in his book for eternity? We read about Moses, Noah, Jonah, King David, great King Solomon, Naomi, Ruth, Deborah, and a host of others. What did they have that God would honor them and remember them in his book for eternity? They never gave up. Each of them had their own stories and different circumstances. But they never gave up. They are remembered. They are remembered because their focus was not broken in the midst of challenges, in the midst of weakness, in the midst of crisis. They remain focused and that is why you and I remember them today. So stop pulling out of difficult situations. Stop pulling out of crises and challenges. Because we serve a God who never dodges a crisis. We serve a God who never dodges a challenge. Stay put and get used to the situation in order to gain the necessary spiritual maturity to see the promise of Father in your life fulfilled. When hard times come, stay put and get used to the situation in order to learn obedience to God and grow in godly character. My father in the Lord and my mentor, Prophet T.B. Joshua, is who he is today because his focus never changed when crisis hit. His focus never changed when challenge came. His life his life story is, a, is an inspiration for you and I that we too can one day get there. That we too can one day become the center of our world if we pay any price to protect our focus. Tell your neighbor, I know where I'm going. Viewers, 
Tell your neighbor, I know where I'm going. I know I can get there. I know I can make it. If only I stay focused and trust God more in my challenges. But today, when challenges come, when confrontation come, we panic. We abandon our position. We abandon our post. We begin to lament, oh, why me of all these problems? We begin to entertain negative thoughts. We begin to grumble against the very being who breathed life into us. We begin to see God in a bad light. And when hard times come, we become discouraged and we give up. Madam, tell me why you're giving up on God. Sir, tell, tell me why you're giving, giving up, up on, on him. him. Tell me why you're giving up on God. Hold on, change is on the way. achievable it is possible amen a Christian who measures his Christian life by the situation he is in will never get to his destination we measure our faith by our situation we allow our situation and our circumstances to get the best of us and to influence our relationship with God. But difficult times are meant to prepare us and to increase our desire for Jesus Christ. Oftentimes we become overwhelmed by things around us and it seems as if our goals and our vision will never be obtainable will not be achievable many times we misjudge our situation because we look at it from the outside we look at it from a carnal point of view many times we must judge our situation and the circumstances we're in 
and we jump to a hasty conclusion and give up. Whereas there's just a short distance remaining to our breakthrough. But we've already given up on our dream. I just want to give you a quick demonstration of what I'm talking about. Here we have our beautiful altar fruit. And I'm sure that every single one of us, every Sunday, admire our blessed altar fruit, including me. Am I right? Oh, I'm not hearing you. You don't admire our beautiful altar fruit? And I'm sure that it goes to each and every one of us mind that, oh, if only I can have the grace to pick one. Or am I wrong? Who does not want an altar fruit? Let me see. Okay, who wants an altar fruit? Ah! Now, there's a wrong perception about our altar fruit. You see, every Sunday, we admire those who get the grace to pick an altar fruit. But there's a wrong perception, you see. We believe that only those who sit in the front might get the grace to actually get an altar fruit. Am I right? So you just believe that if you're sitting in the back, I can give up on my dream. Jump to conclusion that it's not possible. Misjudge my whole situation. I can never get an altar fruit. Am I right? We just believe that those in the front. Well, let me prove you wrong because grace is for all. Can I ask an usher to bring someone from the back of the church for me? Come on, usher, bring someone from the back for me to the altar. This is just a demonstration to show you that our mindset needs to be changed. That It's just a small example, but in the big things in our life, we must judge our circumstances because we see it's not from God's point of view. And we jump to conclusion that, oh, we can never achieve our dream or our goal. But today, I want to prove you wrong because God is a God that does not think the way we think. Amen. God can locate you anywhere you are. Oh, let's clap for our sister as she comes to the front. Come. Oh, let's clap for her. Let's encourage her. Oh, sister, you're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. I want to ask you, did you, would you like an altar fruit? Yes. When you came here today and you sat at the back, did you think you would get an altar fruit? Yes. You thought you would get an altar fruit? I'm going to get the fruit. Because I said the house of God. I know there will be changes in my life today, whether back or front. I'm going to get it. Let's clap for her. But under ordinary circumstances, if you find yourself in the back, do you think that you would be called to come up? Yes. Oh. It's my faith. Wherever I stay, I'm going to come out of the front today. Yes, let's clap for her. Our sister is saying that ordinarily, from a carnal point of view, no. But with her faith, she believes she would get the altar fruit today. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Please come and have an altar fruit. Anyone, just pick one. So can you see how many of us have given up on our dream? But our sister has said it all. Ordinarily, it's not possible. But by her faith, she received her altar fruit today. And that is it. Faith is the key to receive from Jesus. Amen. So when do we know that it's time to give up? Or do we? We should never give up. Because we cannot see beyond our noses when it comes to things of the Spirit. Things that may seem ordinary may have extraordinary effect in the Spirit, much of which is hidden to the ordinary eye. Amen? So let us learn from Naaman. In that book of 2 Kings 5, and we're going to read from verse 1 to 14, we're going to look at the lessons we can learn from Naaman. In the book of 2 Kings 5, 
from verse 1 to 14. Are you there? 2 Kings 5 from verse 1. Now Naaman, a commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great and honorable man in the eyes of his master, because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was also a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. Now because of time, if we read on, we'll see that how the king of Syria sent a letter with Naaman to the king of Israel to receive his healing of leprosy. So we pick it up from verse 7. And it happened when the king of Israel read the letter that he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and make alive? That this man sends a man to me to be healed from his leprosy. Therefore, please consider and see how he seeks a quarrel with me. So it was when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, that he sent to the king, saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Please let him come to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. Then Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stood at the door of Elisha's house. Verse 10, And Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored to you, and you shall be clean. But Naaman became furious and went away and said, Indeed, I said to myself, He will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of his Lord, and wave his hand over the place, and heal the leprosy. Are not the rivers of Damascus better than all the rivers of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. And his servants came near and spoke to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? How much more then when he says to you, wash and be clean? Verse 14. So he went down and dipped seven times in the Jordan. Take note of that. Seven times in the Jordan. According to the saying of the man of God, and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Praise the Lord. Yes, here we read about how Naaman sought to be healed from leprosy and how he reacted when he received the instruction. First of all, Naaman was a bit agitated that instead of seeing the king and his court, he was now sent to go and see a prophet. And then when he got to the prophet's place of residence, prophet Elijah, prophet Elisha made him even more angry By doing what? Sending his servant out to go and deal with him. And if this was not enough for Naaman, he now hears from prophet Elisha's servant what he had to do. What did he have to do? Dip seven times in the dirty Jordan River. Now, this is not how Naaman wanted to receive his healing. And even if it was, there were better rivers, cleaner rivers to do it in. Amen. So when do we give up? One dip, two dips, four dips, five and a half dips? No. Seven dips in the muddy Jordan. When is enough enough? Do you know that if Naaman had given up at dip number three, or even at dip number six and a half, nothing would have happened. How many times do we give up one dip short of our healing? It was the next dip that counted. How many times do we give up one dip short of being cleansed? How many times do we give up one step short from our final breakthrough? How many times do we give up one prayer short of victory? We do not know God's timetable. Therefore, 
we should not give up because it might be one dip short. Amen. Let's look at another very good example. Further in the book of 2 Kings. But this time we go to 2 Kings 13. Two Kings thirteen, take it from verse one. Are you there? Just further on, two Kings thirteen, we're gonna read about Prophet Elisha's arrowheads. Verse one In the twenty third year of Joash, the son of Ahaziah, king of Judah, Jehoahaz, the son of Jehu, became king over Israel in Samaria and reigned seventeen years. So let's go to verse fourteen. Elisha had become sick with the illness of which he would die. Then Joash, the king of Israel, came down to him and wept over his face and said, O my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and the horsemen. And Elisha said to him, Take a bow and some arrows. So he he took himself a bow and some arrows. Verse 16. Then he said to the king of Israel, Put your hand on the bow. So he put his hand on it, and Elisha put his hand on the king's hand. Verse 17. And he said, open the east window, and he opened it. Then Elisha said, shoot, and he shot. And he said, the arrow of the Lord's deliverance, and the arrow of deliverance from Syria. For you must strike the Syrians at Aphek till you have destroyed them. Verse 18. Then he said, take the arrows. So he took them. And he said to the king of Israel, strike the ground. So he struck three times. And did what? And he stopped. And the man of God was angry with him and said, You should have struck five or six times. Then you would have struck Syria till you had destroyed it. But now you will strike Syria only three times. Praise the Lord. King Joash stopped two shots short of complete victory. How many times do you and I stop, give up, just a little distance to our breakthrough? It's a lesson for all of us. Let's also look at the story of Peter at the seaside. The Bible tells us in the book of Luke 5 that Peter had toiled all night and caught nothing. He was fishing. And so Peter was exhausted and he was frustrated. And sensing this, our Lord Jesus Christ said to him, launch into the deep and cast your net for a catch. You know, we can literally feel the anger and frustration and bitterness in the heart of Peter as he complains to Jesus Christ about his hopeless and helpless situation when he said, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. But... If you say so, I will cast down my net one more time. Peter demonstrated here that in spite of all odds, there was need for him to maintain self-control and submit to the one whose will was superior to him. There was enough anger and frustration an emotion in Peter to provoke an emotional outburst and a harsh response towards our Savior because it seemed like it was a heartless instruction. But instead, Peter chose to calmly state his case to Jesus Christ, even though it seemed that Jesus was giving him an instruction to go through the whole painful experience of the previous night again. But he chose to be calm about it. He said he chose to see the situation as an opportunity to honor Christ and appreciate him the more. He said to Jesus, If you, the Lord of the wind and the waves, say so, If you, the author and the finisher of my faith, say so, I will let down my net one more time. In other words, Peter was saying, who am I to disobey you? I know that if I attain the character of a fisherman, 
under your order and your instruction or under any authority that does not proceed from you, if I, if I attain a character of a fisherman under any authority that does not proceed from you, I know that I will not catch anything. But I know that if I labor under your order and your direction, I can never labor in vain. So I will let down my nets one more time. My brothers and sisters, let's learn from Peter. If Peter had given up, if he did not endure till the next morning and endure even what seemed like negative sense evidence, if he had refused to throw in his net one more time and walk out of Jesus, out of anger and frustration, Peter would not have received the breakthrough of his life. If he had walked out on Jesus out of anger and frustration and given up and refused to lay down his net one more time, he would have missed his appointment with destiny. Amen. One last example. The walls of Jericho. We all know the story? Yes. In the book of Joshua 6, we read about the divine instruction given to the Israelites to march around the walls of Jericho seven times. And after they'd marched around the walls of Jericho seven times, the priests sounded the trumpets, the Israelites shouted, and the mighty walls of Jericho crumbled, came crashing down. But you know that if the Israelites got frustrated, got tired after three marches and gave up, or after four marches and gave up, or even six, do you know that the walls of Jericho would not have fallen? So how many times have the foundations of our problems refused to crumble because we gave up? Allow God to answer your questions in His time and not yours. Times of waiting on the Lord is a time where Satan wants you to doubt that God's promises will ever be fulfilled in your life. But times of waiting on the Lord are designed to be such times where our faith is stretched and our intimacy with God is enhanced. In such times of waiting, the best remedy against anxiety is to cast our burdens on the Lord and believe His divine will to calm our spirits. When we are in a time of waiting on the Lord, remember that it honors God to believe Him even when every sense contradicts Him. Many times we run from the very things that bring strength to our lives. We run from tests, we run from trials, we run from pain of all different kinds. We don't want to face it, but it is designed for our spiritual maturity, for our spiritual benefit. Pain of various kinds, tests and trials are designed as training tools in the hands of the Holy Spirit to get us to our destination. So don't dodge them. Stay put. They are to test your maturity. A Christian is tested by his ability to face difficult situations. Finally, my brothers and sisters, as we maintain a relationship with Jesus Christ through faith, we will be enabled to endure and overcome those hardships which and tests. We will be able to endure those tests and hardships which confront us in our daily lives. Tell your neighbor, endure. It is possible. Endure. Because any day from now, I will receive my miracle. So I want to leave you with this song in your heart. I am waiting for my miracle. Any day now. Any day now. I'm expecting my miracle. 